rush of foreign fighters to join ISIS appears to be rising rapidly. According to one study, the number has doubled in the last 18 months. In 2014, an estimated 12,000 people traveled to Syria to fight for ISIS, for a total estimated at 27,000 to 31,000 fresh recruits from all over the globe. That means tens of thousands of sons and daughters go missing and may never return, except in the case of one father from Belgium, Dimitri Bontink. When his teenage son joined a terror group and then disappeared in Syria, Dimitri began a dangerous and incredible journey to bring him home. Full Measure correspondent Scott Thuman has his story of the great escape. If you didn't go to Syria to get your son, would he be alive today? No, no. He would have paid the ultimate, ultimate highest price to die as a martyr. Yeah. Yeah. What Dimitri Bonting faced was an almost impossible and certainly frightening challenge for any father to save his son from a terror training camp inside of Syria. Even the lead up to this moment was baffling. Yayoun was hardly the ideal foreign fighter. Born in Belgium and raised Catholic, he seemed the average teen, even visited Washington, D.C. and spoke admiringly of the American dream. But after a breakup with a girl and meeting another who introduced him to the Quran, Yayoun began to change, and soon after, under the lie that he was going with friends to Amsterdam, he instead went to Syria to join Islamic extremists. We were in shock. Of course, but what do you think? We are not uh, Muslims. Determined to bring him back, Dimitri, a former soldier, began plotting his son's rescue. How am I going to do it? Uh, I don't speak Arabic. I don't have experience in the Middle East. I don't have any connections in the Middle East. The first trip with a journalist turned up nothing. On his second, a solo attempt, Dimitri says he found the group holding his son, led by longtime terror suspect Abu Asir. What did they do to you? They took all my clothes out, uh, beating me. Uh, they put a cap uh, above my head, handcuffed me, and take me upstairs in the place where they interpolate me all the time and beating because they really suspect me to be a spot. They're beating you, they're torturing you. They're torturing me. They're questioning you. Yes. And the whole time you're saying, I'm just trying to find my son. I'm a father who is looking for his son. That I didn't care if I was the father or not, because they say it's Allah decided that he's here and Allah go above everything. It was really, really very hard negotiation. After forming a seemingly odd but necessary relationship with the group, Dimitri and his son were reunited and allowed to leave. The day that you got him out of Syria yes. and across the border, yes. and you're in safety, yes. what is the feeling? The first moment when I know we are safe, 100%, I hold him like a, like a small baby, like a child, you know? We were both crying, you know? We were both crying, it was an emotional, uh, Moment. Yeah. While that story alone seems like a script written for Hollywood, the sequel may be even bigger. I thought I have my son back, and this is over, this nightmare. We're going to start a new life, but my life just started after that. Started because Dimitri's success meant hope for other parents of radicalized teenagers turned jihadis. Through his website and word of mouth, he was soon flooded with requests. The only something I could wish is that all these Western youngsters return home where they belong, you know. But it's not just a wish, you actually go. You yes. go back to Syria. Yes. You go to Iraq. Yes. Yes. How many times? Uh, totally 26 times. And how successful are you at getting children back? I get uh, five back. Five back. Live, physical. One, two, three. Five back. Yep. There have been failures, he says. For example, an unnamed American family in which the son refused to return. And reasoning with the terror groups and often upside down world of backwards logic. Then there's what Dimitri calls government interference. Especially in U.S. cases, is advising the parents not to go there. That's the advice they give. While Dimitri boasts of himself as a modern-day Mother Teresa, he is no longer working for free. The dangers, he says, are too great. You risk your life every time? I risk my life every time. And believe me, ISIS know who I am, and they know when they see me with other parents by the border. They know for what I'm uh, there, what I'm coming to do. They know I'm trying to take uh, kids out. But his calling is too loud. As he puts it, he wakes up Syria, he goes to bed Syria, and couldn't stop, even if he wanted to. 
Dimitri says his son was also held with James Foley, the American journalist who was killed, and John Cantley, the British photographer who is still among the terror groups. Cheryl. And so what happened to his son after he got back? Yeah, so Yeun was released after about 40 days in a Belgian jail uh, for his affiliation with the terror group. He regrets his decision. He says he is no longer religious. And Dimitri says that when he gets to that point, his son will be an advocate to try and deter other young people from being radicalized. He calls him the perfect witness. Scott Thuman, thanks. Very interesting. There's been much debate this week about Muslims entering the United States, but what about Muslims already here? In fact, since the U.S. Census Bureau doesn't ask about religion, we don't have official numbers. But according to Pew Research, a survey in 2011 reported 2.75 million Muslims. The Council on American Islamic Relations estimates there could be now 6 to 7 million Muslims in America. Either way, it means Muslims are minorities in almost every city. But in one town, we found democracy in action and a community with an elected Muslim majority on its government council. Full Measure correspondent Christine Frizzell reports from Michigan. It is a city built on faith and the promise of a new beginning. Hamtramck, Michigan is a small community carved within the boundaries of Detroit. When the auto industry turned Detroit into Motown, Hamtramck doubled in size in one decade, with immigrants rushing to fill the jobs and find the American dream. Now, a century later, that promise remains, as does the faith, though it may look a little different. We are thinking this place is very comfortable to live. Abdul Motlib is the president of the Al Isla Islamic Center and one of the thousands of Muslim immigrants who have chosen to settle here. We can call like uh, United Nations if you go in New York and if you coming in Hamtramck, it look like another United Nations. Walk down the street and you'll see why some say the Middle East has landed in Hamtramck, where the city council now has a Muslim majority. Go in college, huh? Its newest member, Saad Al-Masmari, says he won with a plan to help the struggling economy here. I'm not going to put my uh, religion or my Islam into my politics or into my job. I'm going to help everyone and serve everyone in Hamtramck. For Greg Kowalski, the city historian, it's just the newest chapter of a constantly changing place. Everybody is mixed in, uh, in together. It's really, really fascinating. It sounds like the American dream, like the melting pot. I think it is. I really, really do. But change has not come easy for all, especially some of the longtime residents, like Bernice Kurzawa, who raised her family here. I think there's less social life because you don't talk to many people, and many people don't want to talk to you. Or, in some cases, they can't. I'm sitting on the porch by myself, and she's sitting there by herself, and she's kind of elderly, too, but we can't communicate. For some others who have lived in the city for decades, the change has brought fear. Marie Zolka says she no longer leaves her house. Do you feel like they've assimilated well into the community? Well, I feel like they're going to take it over. Zolka speaks of a time when the city was more than 80 percent Polish. This corner near the center of town perhaps best represents those two worlds. On one side, the painting of an eagle, a symbol seen on the Polish flag. And right across the street, this mural of three Yemeni women painted on the side of a Middle Eastern restaurant. Even though the Polish population only stands at about 11% today, the remnants of the history are everywhere. A statue of Pope John Paul who came to visit the city in the 80s. Polish restaurants and markets. Even the Polish Congress, which sits just footsteps from the Islamic Center. Polonia is still very present in Hamtramck, right? And it's not going to go anywhere anytime soon. Professor Sally Howell has written several books, including Old Islam in Detroit, Rediscovering the Muslim American Past. I honestly don't think there's anything different about Muslim settlement here. It's the same history a lot of people when they came to America. A lot of people, especially from here, like to look at the past and see how things were. Well, we're a historical museum. We think that's a great thing. On the other hand, you have to face the reality, too, that things do change. And change is the one constant in Hamtramck, where Germans were replaced by Polish immigrants in the 19th century, and now Muslims from many nations, with each group a new diversity and new ideas of what it means to be American.
In Hamtramck, Michigan, I'm Christine Frizzell for Full Measure. Still ahead on Full Measure, we follow the money to find federal workers getting paid in some cases for years to do no work.